Holy Ghost, for the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray, O God, reduce and strike the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost. Grant us by the gift of the same spirit that we may be truly wise and never rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. St. Pius X, St. Isidore, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right, so um, got a massive crowd here today for this uh, conclusion to the First Commandment. This is the last lesson on the First Commandment. And we're going to be covering the fact that there are rewards and punishments attached to the fulfillment or non-fulfillment of the commandments by God. And we, we would expect this. The commandments are our laws. And we're very familiar with the fact that in uh, the human world, when, when uh, the state or the mayor or the, the federal government, when they make a law, there is always a certain punishment assigned uh, to not following the law. And there's also a reward assigned to, to following it. You get to keep, for instance, your privileges. You get to keep your driver's license if you're following the laws of the road. Whereas if you're constantly running red lights, they're going to take your license away from you. So um, the thing is, human laws are subject to error. Uh, we, we, we know it's very clear today that, that uh, humans can pass laws that are bad, that are, that are not good laws. But that is not the case with God. Um, his laws are good. And by good, his laws define for us what makes for good. In other words, if we're saying to ourselves, how do I live a good life? How do I live a life that has good effects? Or how do I live a life that has evil effects? What is the nature of being a human being? What, what is the roadmap for a life that has lived well versus one that has lived badly? Then we just go to the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments specify that for us. We know that if we follow the Ten Commandments, our life is going to have good consequences on others, on ourself, right? And if we break the Ten Commandments, our life is going to have bad consequences. So there's rewards and punishments from the following or not following of the commandments that exist both here in this life and in the next life. Obviously, for the next life, you go to heaven or hell. That's, that's the ultimate reward and punishment that, that comes from the commandments. But in this life, there is the reward of having a good life, leading a good life, being a good person. Um, the the peace that the world does not give, as opposed to being a loser, you know, being a jerk, being someone who's, who's bad, um, who's, who's uh, warring against their own human nature as given to them by God and tearing, tearing themselves down, tearing others down. So um, we, um, we struggle as as uh, as human beings uh, to follow the commandments um, we're not big fans of commandments because of our fallen nature and sometimes what can happen is is that the the commandments of the state or the government or what have you can be more immediate for us than the commandments of God that's certainly what happens in secular society uh, people tend to respect their uh, government leaders perhaps more than God. That's true in a secular world. You know, that's definitely true of the, of the left, which is more likely to see the state as a substitute God. Less likely on the right, uh, which, which is, does not hesitate to, to criticize the government if it's not the one they like. But either way, both right and left, if, if they have the government in power that they like, um, they, they tend to exaggerate the importance of those positions of power to the neglect of the ultimate power of God himself. And we have to be careful that we don't do that, that, that we really believe 
that the most important thing for us is to follow the law of God. No matter what the laws of man may be, um, our first point of reference has to be those laws of God. And if there's consequences, if there's negative consequences from following the laws of God, so be it. So be it. You know, we, we just have to be willing to take those consequences um, in, the, in the faith that, that sometimes, you know, we, we, we understand that our reward is not going to come until the next life. But we believe the promises of God and that he will fulfill those promises. So we continue to do the right thing before God, even when there's negative consequences before man. So that's, that's the challenge. Um, so this last part of the first commandment is all about a quotation that's uh, in the book of Exodus. I'm going to try to get some, uh, some better markers here in the colors I've got. So, here's what the book of Exodus says. It says, I am the Lord thy God. Mighty. Jealous. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And showing mercy upon thousands of them that love me. And keep my commandments. So this is Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. You remember last lesson, how we were talking about God decrees the first commandment. I'm the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Then he, get, he says this. He says, here's the rewards and punishments that will come from fulfilling or not fulfilling the commandments. <clears throat> You see, you have the punishment and you have the reward. And we said at the time <clears throat> that this is God saying the punishment and reward for the fulfillment or non-fulfillment of all the commandments, not just the first one. And we even made an argument for the, the uh, Catholic list of the, of the commandments versus the Protestant list. You know, the Protestants have a different list of commandments than the Catholics do. And I don't remember, I don't, I don't know if you, if you remember what, what reason we gave as to why it makes more sense to have one commandment then the punishments and rewards, then the second commandment. Instead of the Protestants say that there's two commandments and then this statement. We say there's one commandment, then the statement. We said it's more, it makes more sense for there to be one commandment and then this statement. Any of, any of you remember um, when we were talking on Fat Tuesday uh, about this? 
<laughs> I said, well, so so the Protestants make two commandments: "I am Lord thy God; thou shalt not strange gods before me," and "Thou shalt not make graven images." And then this, and then the the punishments and rewards. And we Catholics believe there's only one commandment there. And that the, the commandments not to make graven images is included under, I'm the Lord thy God, thou shalt not strange gods before me. Okay. But, but we said the fact that this follows those statements of the first commandment would seem to imply that there's only one commandment before this. If this is meant to be the rewards and punishments for all the commandments, it seems it would just follow one the first commandment. That if you if you're going to say these are the punishments and rewards for, for following or not following all the commandments, you would put it after the first commandment, not after the second commandment. Does that make any sense? Yeah. yeah. So that, that was the argument that, that we gave for that's that's one of the arguments we gave for our list of the commandments. But there's only one commandment before this, because this tells what is true for all the commandments, what rewards you will get and what punishments you will get. What was the other reason why we, that we gave for the Catholic list of the commandments? Bottom the last commandment. We basically just said that it was St. Augustine. St. Saint, Saint Augustine's... Uh, Propose this way of numbering the commandments and he's a pretty important dude. So <laughs> You know, we we respect him. Uh, we think he has a lot of authority He was one of the most prominent fathers of, of the church. And so we follow his list Okay All right um, So That's what follows the commandments, but it's not it's not that it, that doesn't follow the first commandment, but but it's not that this is the only place in Scripture where rewards and punishments are indicated for following or not following commandments. There, there are many other places. The Catechism talks about our Lord speaking in the New Testament about rewards and punishments coming from uh, following or not following commandments. So before we get into this quotation, let's just talk about what, what our Lord says. He gives various rewards and various punishments associated with your observance or non-observance of said commandments. So the rewards are life and heaven. Life is mentioned in Matthew 19, 17. Heaven, Matthew 7, 21. He says, our Lord says, if thou would enter into life, keep the commandments. You get life. You get eternal life. Then he says in Matthew 7, 21, he that does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. What about the punishments? There's various punishments. Um, obviously, hell is is one of the punishments judgment and no forgiveness in Matthew 3 10 our Lord says every tree that does not yield good fruit shall be cut down and cast into the fire. If you, if you don't uh, do what you're supposed to do, lead a good life, um, you'll be cast into the eternal fire. In Matthew 5, whosoever is angry with his brother shall be guilty of the judgment. So breaking the fifth commandment. And then Matthew 6, if you will not forgive men, neither will your Father forgive you your offenses. 
So are we we uh, shouldn't be surprised that our Lord is also speaking about the rewards and punishments that come from either following God's will or not following God's will. Now the Catechism um, speaks about the attitude of two different types of souls when being presented with this fact that God has stepped in as opposed to the, the, the pagan world he stepped in and told us what we need to do. But the pagans, he just left them in their ignorance, right? The, the Incans, the Mayans, the Aztecs, the Babylonians, Chinese, what, whatever, all those people, he left in their ignorance and did not come down and give them a revelation. They lost revelation after Adam at some point, and everybody lost it, and God stepped in, and he instructed the Israelites as to what was what was his will he gave them a revelation so he told them what to do uh, in, in great detail if if you read uh, Exodus Leviticus numbers and so on and he's telling us what to do as well we're, we're, we're the ones receiving those commandments uh, that he gave to Moses as well and and so there's there's two different uh, types of people in receiving these these commandments uh, and we, we have to think about our, uh, about it ourselves. I mean, what's my what's my attitude towards towards the commandments? Okay, I've got these ten things. God's telling me I got to do these ten things. How do I feel about that? Um, do do I like that, does, or do I kind of resent it? But I go, like hang my head and I'm like, all right, I'm going I'm going to do this just because you're making me do it, you know, sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the catechism talks about the spiritual man and the carnal man so the spiritual man is is the one who's animated by the spirit of god and gives him willing and cheerful obedience the spiritual man looks at god commanding god stepping in and saying this is what you need to do and he says wow this is great this is really great because god must care about me if he's, take, he's, if he's making the effort to tell me what I need to do in order to have a successful and good life. Because if he didn't care, he would just, if he was like the deus God, you know, like the deus God who, who just kind of makes things happen, just creates things and says to the human beings, like, hey, here's your earth. Have a good time. I'm, I'm, I'm taking off. See you later. See you in eternity. You know, have a good time. Um, but he just leaves us to our own devices. So uh, if he did that, that would indicate a great indifference on his part. He wouldn't really be a father. He would, he would be a mechanic. He would be uh, a, a clockmaker or what, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's a very um, sort of scientific view that, that they held in the 1700s and, and the 1800s. I just got finished listening to... Uh, the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. It's it's not very long, but uh, it's it's really fascinating. It's it's, it's, it's well written, fascinating life. But he explains in there how he ended up coming, arriving at Deism um, as as his religion. So the Deists they're all about ethics. So they develop for themselves a system of ethics. What's what's the right way to behave, especially towards your neighbor? But they're not at all into theology. He, said, he spoke about one time he went to some Methodist or Pres Presbyterian preacher, and the Presbyterian preacher was just t talking about theology and did not at all talk about how to interact with your fellow man. And so that was one and done for Ben. He, he said, I'm out of here. I'm not coming back. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not interested in this. I, I, want, I want a preacher who tells me, how to practice virtues towards my fellow man. Um, so for, for a deist, the first three commandments don't really matter. Like your relationship with God is not really that important. Like what are my duties towards God? It's not so important. It's really commandments four through 10. How do I interact with my fellow man? Um, don't bore me with theology. Just tell me about how I serve my neighbor. 
So for us, um, for, for hopefully if we're, if we're spiritually minded, it's, it's good news that, that God uh, is concerned about how we live our lives. He really cares about how we live our lives. And also that he's going to reward or punish us, depending on how we act. There's, there's, there's consequences of our actions. And he is keeping a tally. Uh, and and if, if we do well, you know, we're, we're, we're going to get something really nice. If we do badly, we're going to get something really not nice. Um, so the only reason why God could be doing this is because he wants our good. I mean, this is this is how good fathers are. They they make commands to their kids. It's like, look, no, you don't do that. You you do that again. You do that one more time, and you know you're gonna you're gonna get grounded or you're gonna get whooped, um, whatever. So this is the effective way to work with children to to make them be good. You threaten them with punishments. You bribe them with rewards. It's also a source of hope because um, there's implicit in, in, in God giving commandments to us. If he tells us to do something, we know that he's also going to give us the means to accomplish what he asks us to do. So he's, he's not going to be commanding us, you know, uh, you must serve me exclusively. You must go to, to, to mass on Sundays. You have to honor your, your father and your mother. He wouldn't tell us to do these things unless he also gave us the means to accomplish them. So it's, it, there's, it's implicit in him commanding us to do these things that he's going to help us uh, accomplish them. And then the third thing that the catechism points out, uh, this catechism here, is, is that God is, is favoring us by giving us these commandments. There's very much the note of when, when he's working with the Israelites, like, you're my people, I'm your God. And you give me glory by following my will. So we, we become the instruments of God's glory on this earth by doing what he commands. Um, we pay homage to him by obeying him. We give a good example to those around us. And, I mean, that's, that's a pretty awesome thing. You, you think about when, how, how flattered we are. If someone important comes up to us and say, you know, hey, can, can you do something for me? Can, can you take care of this? Can, can you do this for me? Like, well, of course, of course. You know? um, if, if it's something, someone re really important. So this is God saying to us, I need you to do these things. And by doing it, you're going to promote my glory. Um, that's a nice thing. So this is, this is the attitudes of the spiritual man. So, someone has an interior life and um, who, who has a good spirit, a good uh, attitude are going to see the commandments in this way. The carnal man, on the other hand, is, is the one who obeys God more in a spirit of servitude than in a spirit of willingness. So he obeys out of fear rather than out of love. He fears the punishment is going to come to him, and that's why he does, he does the commandments. He's not loving the commandments. He's not loving God. Um, he's, it's, 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 there's a certain selfishness there. He just wants to cover his back. So, the carnal man sees the commandments as burdensome and severe and often doesn't understand why they're there. They seem arbitrary. It's just God's just like making this stuff up because he just wants me to obey and he's got the power. He's got the power to enforce. So, I just have to because he has more power than I have power, I just have to do what he says. Now, this is a kind of a <clears throat> Islamic view of, of God, They're like Allah. Um, you know, Islam means submission. It, it's all about submission. You're, like, you, you're not supposed to understand why Allah wants you to do this. And, and you know, the, the Quran, it contradicts itself. God, God can contradict himself. He can command you one thing the next day, command you the opposite the, the, the following day. But it's just what he says. He's, he's in charge. He's got the power. So you just do what he says. So the, the carnal man is, is, is more, more tends to see the commandments in, in that light as being um, really they don't make sense. Uh, they're too difficult. Uh, 
Uh, I would be happier if I did not have to fulfill them. They restrict me, they constrain me, they limit my possibilities. But what can I do? Um, so the Catechism says that the carnal man must be encouraged by pious exhortation and led by the hand so that he can grow in the love of God. Um, like, dude, get off your video games, get off your cell phone, do some praying, do some spiritual reading, and then you will receive light in your soul and you will understand there's a reason behind the commandments and actually they're not arbitrary, therefore you're good, therefore you're flourishing. You will flourish if you do these things. If you make these sort of the bedrock of your behavior. Okay, so having said that, let's, let's look at this quotation. I am the Lord thy God, mighty, jealous, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy upon thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So God gives two characteristics of his being, mighty and jealous. He's mighty. On the one hand, that means that we can't escape God, um, says, says the catechism. Uh, he sees everything. There may be a measure of leeway with human laws. You know, this is, this is part of the aspect of human laws that they cannot be completely enforced. There's no police state that, that's, that, you know, even in 1984, that's so exhausted that can see absolutely everything, hear absolutely everything, and enforce consequences. But God is capable of doing that. God, God is, is almighty. He sees everything. Um, and he, give, he does give us leeway. He, he, he gives us a long leash in this life. But one day he's going to catch up with us, no matter what. Even with regards to the rewards, there's, there's, there's a bit of a long leash. He's, he's not going to step in and give us all of our rewards right now. Um, he's waiting to see how many points we rack up and then... You know, when it's time for our judgment, then he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant, and, and bring us to our glory. Um, so we get, we get limited reward here below. We get full reward hereafter. So the, the catechism encourages us not to be deceived by the appearance of people getting away with sin. You know, um, there's, there's, there's infinite possibility today online for people to, to look at crime stories or um, recently talked to, to a guy who, who used to be a, uh, a police officer who um, used the show America's Most Wanted to get the criminal. He was after you. So he, the, the criminal just kind of went incognito um, and was rumored to think about fleeing to Mexico. So he managed to get an uh, America's Most Wanted episode about this guy. And somebody found him. Somebody found him and reported him. Um, so he busted him, and the guy got 30 years in jail. Um, but it doesn't always work like that, and we know that uh, the evil, those who do evil, are often not punished as they should be in this life. And it seems like, okay, you can get away with murder. A lot of people can get away with murder in this life. Um, that doesn't may, mean they're getting away with things. God will catch up with them. On the other hand, the fact that God is mighty does not means that we cannot say that, that the, the commandments are too hard. Um, God is mighty to help us. We, he will assist us to fulfill the Ten Commandments. We can all do all things with the help of God. Then God is jealous. I don't know if you remember the, uh, the sermon that, that Father McBride gave about envy versus jealousy. I won't tell him. <laughs> It was a long time ago. It was last month. No, I'm just joking. 
<laughs> I don't remember what you ate this morning. <laughs> so uh, no, it was it was probably six months ago or nine months ago. But <clears throat> he was explaining with envy. You want what someone else has. That's 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 envy. I, I see the the excellence of someone else, um, and I and I want it. Whereas jealousy is you're protecting what you have. You're saying this is mine. Do not touch this. Okay. Um, so God is a jealous God. He protects his interest. He he protects his own rights. So. He's going to have us answer for us respecting or not respecting his rights. This is what the deists do, do not admit, right? This is what the deists would say. We don't need to worry about God. We just need to worry about each other. So let's be good to each other and form good ethical standards in our relations with, with our fellow men. But let's not really worry about God, like who he is or the, his, his attributes, um, whether this religion is correct religion, that religion is correct religion, whether these beliefs are correct, those beliefs are blessed, just forget about all the religious beliefs. Let's just focus on ethical behavior. This is not, this is not what this is saying. I am um, the Lord thy God, mighty, jealous. So God is deeply interested in our affairs and, and what we do um, and with relation to him. He's interested on the relationship that we form with him whether it's good or it's bad, uh, whether we are acting as a creature, respecting the creator, saying, okay, this is what, what God is saying, so I need to respect that and do that. Um, <clears throat> so the jealousy, says the catechism, is that divine love and charity by which God will suffer no human creature to be unfaithful to him with impunity. He will not suffer human creatures to be unfaithful to him and just let it go. Like, that's all right. No problem. Who am I to judge? You do what you do. I do what I do. It's all good. It's all good. That's not God. That's not God. He's not going to give people a free pass. Um, when they say, well, you gave me free will, so I just used it, you know? But yeah, not in the right way. You abused your free will to act against me, who am your God, and the one who created you in a specific way. You were meant to do these things, act according to the way I created you, and you acted the opposite way. Catechism says also, it is the most tranquil and impartial justice which repudiates as an adulteress the soul corrupted by erroneous opinions and criminal passions. So th this is very on PC of the catechism to say this. The, so th this, is, this, is, this is something that, that our modern world just does not uh, think about. It, it does not see God in this way. Uh, that, that God somehow is, is going to be impartially just. The, the merciful God and the reward part, they're all for that. But the just God who punishes you for not doing what he says, including when it doesn't hurt your neighbor, they, they don't, they, 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 no, there's no way, no way. It's, um, the, the Catechism points out how it's interesting in, that, that God compares himself often to a spouse, protecting the interests of his marriage. So he contracts with, the Israelite people. He has this bond with them. Um, they are his people. He is their God. And when they are betray him, they go against him, it's compared to fornication. It's compared to adultery, um, infidelity. It's, it's, it's always compared to a, a, a couple when, when one of the parties is not faithful to the other party. So you can think about the jealousy of the marriage is simply the, the spouse is protecting the interests of their marriage. And we can think about God protecting the interests of his relationship with his creatures. That's what's meant by him being jealous. And this is out of love for us. Okay. So what about the punishment visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children? This is a difficult one, isn't it? 
Yeah. Hard to make a distinction. How do, how do we distinguish between third and fourth generation and thousands that love me? How do you make? How do you know which is which? Really down. How I interpret that, I guess, is that it's down to the individual's choice. Right. So you're saying. So. So it seems the punishment falls falls upon people who don't choose it, and the reward just falls upon those who choose it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it kind of yeah. it kind of reads that way. Yeah. It kind of reads that way. Um, so the Catechism says God will not suffer sinners to go unpunished, but will chastise them as a father, or punish them with the rigor and severity of a judge. The chastisement. Is for here below the punishment is for hereafter for those who do not chast receive the chastisement well uh, god chastises sinners here below they they receive a certain return for their sins and they can respond well to that chastisement wake up hit rock bottom maybe say i need to correct my life i need to amend and put themselves on the straight and narrow or not, and then they will get the severity of the judge after this life is over. Okay, what about God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation? And, you know, there's, there's uh, the, the, sort of the fad in traditional Catholic circles these days about the, the whole question of generational spirits. And they, they'll, they'll take quotes like this and they'll say that, well, there's a demon that can inhabit your family line. And like if you if there's a record of alcoholism in, in your in your family, then that's because it's possessed by a certain demon or there's a certain demon afflicting it. And to get rid of alcoholism, you have to exercise that demon. You have to say these deliverance prayers to get the demon um, out of your family line. And that's just not the case. It's just, and this this is a kind of a, a, a novel teaching. I once did a question and answer with Andrew Latham uh, about this. It's just, um, it seems that this teaching came from ultimately from Protestantism. Um, but, you know, we always have free will. And so each generation can has the means to accomplish the commandments. Uh, there, there's, there's not no question of a, of a demon forcing you to to be an alcoholic. The, the catechism makes this clear as as well. So, God is stronger than the devil. If people live under God, then they will be able to conquer their demons. Um, and by that, I mean their own unruly passions, not the devil. So, the catechism says that that this uh, visiting. Of the iniquity of fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation means that some children are going to have to suffer from the sins of their parents. And we know that this is obviously the case. The primary example is us suffering from the sins of Adam and Eve, right? Because we're all fallen as, as a result. But you can think about all kinds of, of situations. Um, for, for whatever reason, I don't know why, but right when I read that, I, I thought about those terrible situations where like a pregnant mother is uh, drinking in excess or uh, taking drugs, you know, and then her, her child is affected. Uh, it has like fetal al alcohol syndrome, or whatever. But you think about <clears throat> parents who uh, they do not uh, manage their money well. And they, they, they have a lot of money, then they, then they go into poverty because they don't manage their money well, and the, and the children have to suffer. Um, so there are certain sins of parents that do get visited upon their children, and their children have to suffer the consequences. There's other sins of the parents that the children don't have to suffer for. For instance, if, if the uh, parents get a non-contagious disease because of their sins. Um, so... Well, I mean, an another example is that when, in, in times past, when it used to be a stigma uh, for children to be illegitimate, or, or uh, when, when children are had out of wedlock and, and their, their father is not around, you know, the, the circumstances of their conception were not good. And the, the child is going to have to suffer from that because of the fact that 
they're not going to have their father in their lives, right? The, 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 her, the, the mother did not um, take the effort to have good relationships and, and meet someone with whom she could marry and, and form a family, but, you know, she just shacked up or, or whatever and had this child, and now the child's going to have to suffer from that. Um, so, the, the, as I said, the catechism really wants to, to point out, and in the end, um, we will only have to answer for our own sins. And we, we may suffer from the consequences of the sins of our parents, but if we bear that well, it's going to redound to our glory. This is the thing. God can always make good out of evil, and um, there's more reward when that happens. That rather than us just being provided everything on, on a silver platter. There was recently a, 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 letter, <clears throat> a letter from the district superior of Switzerland um, posted on sspx.org. He was, he was writing to his people, and he was just like talking about vocations and why we don't have vocations. And, um, and he said, I think one of the problems is we've, we've got it too easy. We, we've got our we've got our churches now. We've got our, our priories. We've got our school. We're giving you giving you everything. And people people are just um, taking it for granted, and it's just human nature. Unless there's some difficulty, <clears throat> they find it hard to be inspired to generosity, unless they have to fight for something. So, um, here's here's what the catechism says on this difficult subject and you know i mean you can go into the old testament you'll find some language like this but you'll also find um clear statements that that the children do have free will and they only have to answer for their own sins like the book of ezekiel um the, 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 there's there's a chapter where where it says there's a proverb among you that the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the teeth of the children are set on edge to mean that, that the children have to suffer from the sins of their, of their parents. And Ezekiel says, God says to Ezekiel, let this no more be a proverb among you. you know, we're, we're, we're not going to be uh, conceiving things this way anymore. Xavier, welcome. <laughs> Better, better late than never. <laughs> so, the Catechism says, the faithful are also to be taught that the punishments here threatened await the third and fourth generation of the impious and the wicked. Not that the children are always chastised for the sins of their ancestors, but that while these and their children may go unpunished, their posterity shall not all escape the wrath and vengeance of the Almighty. And they give an example uh, from the Old Testament, King Josiah, one of, the, one of the last kings of Judah. His father, Manasseh, was very wicked, reintroduced idolatry into Israel. And then King Josiah tried to correct things, tried to do things that were, that were well done. And during his reign, they, uh, they were trying to repair the temple, and they were collecting funds, doing, doing a fundraiser, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they started on the repairs of the temple and, and they, they found in the temple a copy of the law which I guess strangely they didn't have anymore like what happened they didn't even have a copy of God's law among them and so the, the, the person who found it came in and read it before Josiah's and he started weeping he's like oh we're really not following this um, but strangely enough they, they went to a prophetess um, I can't remember her name, but they went to this, this prophetess and said, what, what, what's, what, what, is, what does God say about this situation? And she said, well, um, during the reign of King Josiah, he will not have any problems. But after he's dead, all hell is going to break out. Yeah, pretty much what she said. And that's what happened. So, so, so he did not have to suffer the consequences of what his father had done. But the following generation, the next generation, the third generation, had to suffer those consequences. All right. Um, then the mercy part. Uh, so the visiting of the Nicholas fathers, sorry, uh, is not necessarily um, preventing them from following God's law. No. It's just part of the suffering. 
Exactly. Of their exactly. Yeah. They're going to have to suffer the, the consequences of their parents' actions. But this does not imply moral evil on their part. And it's up to them to decide what to do with that suffering, whether to receive it well, carry their cross, gain a reward, or be resentful and, you know, fight against the cross. So showing mercy, showing my mercy upon thousands of them that, that love me, the Catechism says that God's mercy to the good far exceeds his justice towards the wicked. Um, it, by, by the change of language, showing mercy upon thousands. Um, there's, there's more specification of, of the, the scope of, of the punishment here. Then the, the, it's more general with the, with the mercy. Um, so it's a, it's a little obscure, but the, the change of language indicates that. Of them that hate me versus them that love me. So that those, th this language about the fact that if you break the commandments of God, it really is a hatred against God. That's what the, the catechism wants to say about this. Um, not following the commandments of God is saying to God, I do not respect you. I don't care what you tell me what to do. I'm going to do my own thing. So there, there is this implicit hatred, and, and therefore with, with someone like, like Benjamin Franklin, who says, forget the first three commandments, um, forget this question of me serving and respecting God as God, or worrying about God as God, just let me focus on my neighbor. There's, there's, there's a, a profound disrespect of God there. So then of them that love me, this shows that we receive reward for doing the commandments, not so much for the fact of doing them, but for loving God. We're, we're supposed to follow the commandments out of love for God, not just because he's got more power than we do and he's going to smash us if we don't do them, um, but because he's a good father. All right. So I, uh, I just have a little story for you from the life of St. Catherine of Siena about her mother. You know, um, her, her name was uh, Mona Lapa. I guess maybe it's an Italian thing you, you call um, Mrs. Or the Mona, like you got Mona Lisa, right? Um, I, I don't know. But, you know, she gave birth to uh, 25 kids. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know how that's possible. So many of them died in childbirth or not uh, at childbirth or in infancy or at a young age. Um, St. Catherine was the 24th child. But uh, Mona Lapa uh, was sick and dying and she did not want to die. She did not want to follow God's commandment that we die. Um, so this, this story is, is about the, the consequences of, of that. Um, I'm just going to play you the story from an audiobook. It's a reading of the life of St. Catherine of Siena from, uh, by Sigrid Unzet. Yeah, really great biography. Um, so it's just four minutes, but it's a great little illustration of, well, if you, if you don't want to submit to God's will, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you know, God gets to say what happens. So you don't really have a choice. It's better to just submit to his will. Um, make sure I've got enough volume here. Jacopo's death, the terrible things which she saw and heard around her, the constant anxiety for the lives of her sons, were too much for Mona Lapa, who was by now an old woman. She began to fail, and after a while it became obvious to everyone in the house that she would never rise again from her sickbed. But Catherine prayed ceaselessly to her Lord that she should be allowed to keep her mother. Finally, she was answered from above that Lapa was much more sure of salvation if she died now 
instead of continuing to live and experience all the sorrows which threatened her in the future. Catherine went to her mother, and as tenderly and affectionately as she could, tried to make Lapa understand how much better it would be for her if she would submit to our Lord who called her to him, and give herself over to the will of God without resistance. But Lapa was still bound to this world, which she was not willing to leave. She was terribly afraid to die, and begged her daughter to pray even more earnestly that God might let her live. Never talk to me of dying. However much it pained her, Catherine was bound to admit to herself that her mother was ill-prepared for death. She prayed with all the strength of her aching heart that God would not divorce her mother's soul from the body before it had submitted to his will. Lapa grew worse and worse, but still lived. It was as though God's maiden had thrown herself in front of her mother and protected her from death. But even though God seemed to listen to the prayers of the daughter, she begged her mother in vain to loosen her despairing grip on life and trust God to know best. Christ said to Catherine, Say to your mother, who today does not want to depart from the body, that a time will come when she shall call aloud and pray to die without being heard. Nothing helped, and one day Lapa died, or so it seemed to all the women who stood round her bed. She had refused to confess and refused to receive the last sacrament, and Catherine lay over her mother's corpse and prayed and wept aloud. Oh, my dear Lord, is this how you keep the promise you once made me, that none in this house should suffer eternal death? You promised me, too, that you would not take my mother from this world before she could leave it in a state of grace. And here she lies dead, without having confessed or received the sacrament. My beloved Savior, I call to you in your great mercy. Do not fail me. I will not go alive from your feet until you give me my mother back. Speechless and overcome, the women round the deathbed saw that life seemed to creep back into Lapa's body. She breathed faintly and made some slight movement. A day or two later, Mona Lapa was on the way to recovery, and after a short time was quite well again. Raimondo mentions by name the women who were witnesses of this miracle. The two Mantalate, Caterina Getty and Andrea Vanni, and Lisa, Lapa's daughter-in-law. He also tells us that Lapa lived to be 89. She lived to see the end of her family's prosperity and happiness, and the death of her daughters and most of her grandchildren. She had a little house near the Porta Romana far from the place where she had lived as a busy, robust housewife in the midst of a large and happy family. And sometimes she complained, I think God has wedged my soul crossways in my body so that it cannot come out. <laughs> Chapter 8 <laughs> So, she did not want to die, and so she refused to, to make her confession receive last rites, uh, but she was fortunate. She uh, had a saint for a daughter, and her daughter brought her back to life because of this deal she made with our Lord that none of her family would go to hell. Um, and then the prediction was fulfilled where Mona Lapa lived till she was 89, and she even witnessed, you know, St. Catherine died when she was 33, and 1380, um, and uh, they did something very Italian with the relics. They cut her head off. Uh, she died in Rome, so they, they cut her head off, and they took it to Siena, and they had this procession bringing her head <laughs> back to Siena, um, and, and Mona Lapa was there, you know, for, for this uh, triumph of, of her daughter. Um, but so you see there both the justice and the mercy of God um, normally speaking, it's him for to, to decide when we die, not for us. And we have to be resigned. If it's time to go, it's time to go. 
You just get your soul in order and you resign yourself. Um, but also that the power of prayer, if, if you're a saint, <laughs> you, can, you can bend God to, to show mercy um, uh, upon your loved ones. So that's, that's all I've got for today. Um, if there's any questions, um, comments, um, about, okay. Talking about general generation of spirits and the same curse being visited upon the children of the Pope, namely the faithful who refer to him as the Holy Father. That was the question. Can the same curse be visited upon the children of the Pope? Um, is that thinking like an Alexander the Sixth Pope? <laughs> I think they're referring to like the faithful. Yeah. You know, oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. I mean, I mean, absolutely. We suffer a lot from bad leaders in the church. So um, Catholics today, uh, since the Second Vatican Council, we've had to suffer, and so you see it played out in in our Catholic world today. This challenge of, well, we have to suffer um, from the, the changes from, from the council. We have to suffer from the persecution of, of traditional Catholics, and we're all going to bear it in different ways. We can use this for our sanctification. If we rise to the occasion, um, we, we, we merit a lot by, by doing so, by remaining faithful to God and, and showing respect for God. Um, yeah, this is one of the tragic things. is like there seems to be a loss of respect for the rights of God among churchmen. Um, and just this focus on on the neighbor, right? It's it's kind of this similar to what uh, Benjamin Franklin was doing in his time, because it's all about let's let's please the world, let's look nice and everything. But what 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 about the respect owed to our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament? You know, isn't isn't that really important? Like, well, no, you know, we'll, we'll just give communion in the hand, we'll have all these Eucharistic abuses, what have you. Um, but. Meanwhile, welcome, welcome and, and approve everybody for all their behavior, same-sex marriage, or what have you. So we, uh, we definitely have to suffer from our spiritual parents today, and we have the choice of, of how we're going to deal with that. We're going to bear the cross, remain faithful to God in, in spite of the persecution we might receive, or just capitulate you know, and go along. Yeah, question. Um, like most people, like most people, unfortunately. All right. Well, let's see a prayer. <clears throat> In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. Our Lady, help of Christians. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Welcome.